During the First World War, a lot of enterprising people, like predominantly newspapers, came up with the idea of issuing a weekly magazine, you go to your newsagent, buy your weekly magazine on the First World War. Now, as far as they knew back then, World War I was only going to last until Christmas of 1914, and it would be all over. Unbeknown to them, it was to go on until 1918. So at the time, they all thought that what we'll do is, we'll publish a weekly magazine, people can collect the magazine, and then eventually, when the magazine finishes, they can take all the magazines to the local news agents where they bought, bought them from, and for a, a set fee, the news agents will bind them into hardback volumes to preserve for years and years to come. Now, a lot of these magazine format things, as individual magazines today, are not worth collecting as separate items. They're only worth it if they're still bound as hardbacks. Um, a lot of them run to maybe 10 volumes, a lot can run to 15, 20 volumes. Loads of different companies produced magazines because it was it was the latest in thing was World War I back then because everybody wanted to get on the bandwagon. One of the most interesting series of magazines wasn't produced until 1938. It was produced by, I think it was Cassell, somebody like that. It was entitled 20 Years After. It was a guy from England, went on the battlefields, World War I, in 1938, so one year before World War II started. Of course, they didn't know it was going to be around the corner. But in 1938, some guy got into his modest minor, drove to the First World War battlefields, snapped some pictures, 20 years after then and now, was issued in magazine format, he collected all the magazines, he toddled off to your news agents when he got them all done, and for an outlay of, this is an original advert, 20 years after, this would be in one of the magazines, when you got all the magazines, for an outlay of five shillings, you could have them all bound into solid volumes through your local branch of W. H. Smith's. So, the complete run of 20 years after, ran, when you got them all, to three volumes. Each volume has 800 pages. In this particular binding, bound by Nunes, 20 years after the battlefields of 1914, 1918, then and now. Now being the date of publication, which was 1938. I'm pretty certain it was 1938, going by the motorcar team. Because in the photographer's photographs, in the now photographs, a lot of them feature the same car, which is the 1937-38 um, Morris Minor. And it also mentions in the last volume that the last war memorial to be made was the Australian one, which took 20 years to build because of the 1930 depression it didn't get completed until spring of 1938. So I'm pretty certain that them, these actually came out 1938. And another clue is 1918, 20 years after 1918, is 1938. So one year before the war in Europe started, World War II, this set of magazines came out. You collected them all up. You went to your news agents, five shilling, you rebound them, and they came in, when you got them back, they came in one, two, three volumes, which some 80 odd years later, makes a really interesting item for your shelf, if you can find them. And I would recommend that you look for them bound, don't buy the disbound separate ones, because they're not worth having. So I've earmarked a couple of pages, we won't go through them all, because there's, there's 800 pages per volume, there's three volumes, so I will... Have a look at the sort of things you got up to in 1938. This was some, what, 38, 48, 58, 68, some 40 odd years before the After the Battle series of magazines came into being. So as, as early as 1938, somebody was going around the world on battlefields taking photographs. Now bear in mind that in 1920, that was the first year that the relatives of people who died or people who served in France could actually go over on proper tours and they could see where the loved ones were at, where they died at, where they served at. And also, they could buy souvenirs, because there was still quite a lot of souvenirs there. There was a lot of, in 1920, uh, villages that had still not been rebuilt. So what the villagers used to do, they used to scour the battlefields, bring stuff in, put up uh, plinths in front of the local church, put pickle albs, German helmets, bits and pieces, and sell them to the tourists. And that's where trench art comes from. Trench art, nothing to do with soldiers in the trenches making stuff. Trench art, these beaten brass shell cases were actually made by French civilians for sale in 1920 to English tourists to take back home. And over the years people have thought, oh, a British soldier's made that in the trench. Not so. So that's where trench art originated from. So we'll have a look through these. Um, you may have difficulty finding 
such a bound set nowadays. You may find them disbound, but a lot of them at the time, they were fairly expensive books. My dad collected these in the 1970s, and we've got quite a lot of bound volumes on the war. We've got, for example, the Times History of the War, 1914, because back then, as I said, as far as the Times was concerned, the war was going to end in 1914. So all the bound volumes of the Times History of the War, although it runs to seven volumes, they're all dated 1914. So the Times History of the War, 1914, as far as they were concerned, it was only going to run to 1914. Then we've got, um, again, The War, which is a new one's one. Then we've got World War 1914-18, History of the War, which runs to 3, 6, 9, 10, 15 volumes. Then you've got Pictorial History of the War, which is World War II, The Second Great War. They also issued magazines for World War II as well. And again, the individual World War II magazines, not worth getting, they're only worth getting in bound volumes. The World War II bound volumes are easier to find than the World War I ones. Um, and also, Hutchinson's Pictorial History of the War, deeds that filled the empire. A lot of companies did jump on the bandwagon, but for the immediate post-war 1938, after the battle type pictures, only one company did it. That was this guy, 20 years after the battlefields in 1940, 1980, then and now. Generally, it's... Once it's all bound up, it's three volumes, 800 pages per volume. So we'll have a quick flick through some of them and see if you can find them. And um, it's the 100th anniversary of World War One being around the corner. I think these are quite interesting. You may have difficulty finding them. So this is how, when you've got your magazine at your news agents, you'd find this in it, which said, hey, when you've got your magazine, take it to your news agents, we'll bind it for you. This is WH Smith's own binding, which is different to the Nunes binding. That one there is the Nunes, as it says there, Nunes. It's gold blocked, <coughs> volume one. It's uh, red cloth covers. You could also get them in leatherette. But WH Smith bound them like that. Five shilling per volume. My local branch was and still is 79 King Street, Whitehaven. WH Smith would bind them three different formats. A reinforced binding in blue vellum, lettered in gold, the deluxe binding with red morocco, back and art cloth sides, and the publisher's red cloth case. So originally there were magazines, but they were rebound for a nominal sum per volume. So 20 years after, the battlefields of 1914, 1918, then and now. And this is the Nunes version. Typical contents, how the war began, contemptibles at Mons. It goes through all various stages. It's not in chronological World War One order. So you'd have Mons here. You'd have elsewhere through the volume. You'd have um, the Dardanelles. So it's it's not in chronological war order. So the typical bits and pieces in it. You'd have occasionally through the magazine. You'd have a section of pictures south of or north of wherever then and now. So that will be it then. The photographer will go back 1938, take pictures, and again, then and now. So you'd have various then and now photographs. I've earmarked some bits and pieces, and it's profusely illustrated throughout. It's going to take forever to go through, so I won't bother going through it. But I've earmarked some pictures. So this this is Gallipoli in 1938. It's still got all the stuff lying around. And that's V Beach. And down here. And on the other page, if I remember right, on the other page, we've got an iron dump, various bits and pieces. All odd shells, filled or empty, lie about in scrub or nuller at hells. This dump, the only collection of any size, is in open country near Crithia. It will be noted that the copper driving bands have been removed. Iron, lead and tin are plentiful, but apart from odd rounds of small arms ammunition, there is very little brass. This is because copper and brass are marketable metals. Up here we have what they call litter. We call collector's items. Top of a mess tin. Here and there, little collections of litter of 1915 can still be found at Hells. In this group, jam and bully tins, a mess tin lid and a broken rum jar can be seen. In spite of the number of full rum jars known to be buried in 1915, those found today in 1938 are all broken. 
heavy winter rains often expose such relics as the above. So there you go, still in situ. As we go through, everywhere it's got these divisional badges. It's also got cap badges spattered here and there throughout the book. So it's, it's interesting from that point of view. And again, as we come through, every so often in the now photographs, there's this Morris Minor motor car from 1938. That's the photographer's car. So he matches it up with a period picture. That's the Contel Mazon Beacourt Road in 1916. So that's the same place in 1938. So it's just like this throughout the book. So there's quite a lot of interesting stuff in it dotted throughout. And as I say, it started off as a magazine format and you collect them every week. So, that, so that's volume one. Now volume two, again, I've earmarked some bits and pieces through it. That's some sectionalized shells. So again, I'm just giving you kind of an example of what's what's in it. We're not going to see all of it. 20 years after 1938, road signed to Amiens with two shells sitting on the top of it. And again, we have cap badges. As I say, throughout the whole three volumes, it's like this. And then we have, this is one enterprising guy's collection of relics. We've got a French machine, this is 1938, French machine gun, a stack of rifles, trench mortar, some huge shells, an airplane engine, some armour, some trench armour, um, a tiny proportion of the remarkable collection of war relics unearthed and continuing to be unearthed by farmers in the neighbourhood of Hill 60. These are purchased by an enterprising Belgian ex-serviceman who resells them to souvenir hunters. His supply of material seems to be without end. And in this representative display, one can easily recognise aerial torpedoes, trench mortars, aeroplane engines, steel breastplates, many rifles, and, suspended from a tree in the centre, a harness such as was used by the Germans for sky illumination rockets. Grimmer reminders of the past in the shapes of corpses also come to light not infrequently. So this is 1938 and the stuff that was being found on the battlefields and sold to tourists. Believe it or not. So I wonder, I wonder who bought that like six foot tall shell. Wouldn't mind having that in your garden. So that's volume number two. So volume three. In volume three, it starts to show quite a lot of Canadian and New Zealand badges all the way throughout. And also, it shows some bits that have been claimed by the Imperial War Museum in 1938. These are original trench signs. And trench signs there as well. And there's some soldiers, lucky souvenirs, little teddy bears and stuff again, from the Imperial War Museum. And in the back of volume three, it has a We Will Remember Them section on building the war memorials. And it says somewhere, if I find it, if I can find it. Here we are. Last but not least, almost certainly the last of the great national war memorials, Australia's monument at Villas Bretonneau is still incomplete nearly 20 years after the armistice. The four pictures on this and the next page show various phases of construction. So this is constructing the Australian War Memorial. And as you can see, hand sewing these huge blocks, laying the stones with the names on. And it says here, sewing by hand, the Villas Breton Air Memorial was, not, was originally planned in 1928, but the financial crisis of 1930 interrupted work on it, which was not resumed until 1937. It was then estimated that the monument would be completed by the spring of 1938, just 20 years after the German offensive in which many of the diggers commemorated fell. So this is 1938, still constructing the Australian Memorial. So this, this, this section in the back of the book is, is quite interesting because it shows them building all the memorials and a section of helmets, newly claimed by the Imperial War Museum at the time, a section of German helmets. So that's just one of many what was originally a weekly magazine which you collected took the news agents they rebound them but 
this is the only set that deals with like after the battle pictures all the other ones were made during the war and they went on for quite a lot of volumes this particular set on world war one came out in 1938 it does turn up occasionally and it is well worth having so that's 20 years after the battlefields of 1914 18 then and now published circa 1938 by Nunes. well worth keeping an eye out for